The NSCAA is delighted to have Dr. Joe join us today for his topic, Keeping Your Best Team on the Field, a webinar that focuses on injury prevention with young athletes. Dr. Joe is a well-known medical professional in the soccer world. He has a wealth of soccer experience and knowledge of the game. He is a player, a USSF B licensed coach, and a Major League Soccer referee. Joe is beginning his third year as the head athletic trainer and medical team coordinator for the Fort Lauderdale Strikers, and is the founder and owner of Atlantic Rehabilitation Center, which began operating in 2002. Joe has a doctorate in physical therapy and as a cl clinical instructor at local universities. Joe and his staff have been providing oversight for several NSCAA coaching courses from the home location in Florida. So welcome to the presentation, Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I wanted to uh, talk about a few things first and say hello to everybody. Today's uh, topic is going to be about keeping your best team on your field on the field as you see Spain being the best team in 2010. Uh, we're going to talk today about a couple of things, the most common injuries in soccer, how injuries occur, good versus bad training techniques for coaches and players, and then also exercises to help decrease or reduce lower extremity injuries. Some of the uh, things that we're going to discuss which we're looking at were the top four time loss injuries in soccer. And if you look, ligament injuries, obviously in the ankle and the knee, some of the areas where they're most common, lateral ankle sprain or the ACL ligament, which uh, leads to the most concern in soccer due to the uh, surgical procedures and the time loss. With the muscles, mostly hamstring strains and, and groin strains. We're looking here at the 2010 World Cup did some research on that, and of the 32 finalist teams, there was 229 injuries reported. 82 of those injuries were from uh, in an actual game, and 58 injuries were training injuries. That equated to about 40.1 match hours loss and 4.4 training hours loss per 1,000 hours. So in the 2010 World Cup, in regards to the previous World Cups, 2006, in 2002, injuries were significantly lower. And one of the reasons they thought about was it was probably mainly due to injury prevention. And some of the other things they looked at was due to less foul play from the players and coaches and also stricter refereeing. So uh, I guess I can give a little credit to some of my referee friends out there. Uh, doing a better job on the field, too, helps. Some of the uh, things that they wanted to look at, too, is non-contact injuries had increased from previous World Cups. Contact with another player, some other percentages, was about 65% in the World Cup, and training injuries were about 40%. Most frequently, the non-contact injuries were hamstrings and groins, so pulling your muscle. Other most frequent contact injuries were ankle sprains. The, uh, some of the other things we looked at, too, hamstring and groin muscle strains, most commonly, again, like I said, non-contact injuries and ankle and knee injuries could be contact or non-contact from a slide tackle, from uh, planting and cutting and, and rolling your ankle or somebody tackling you and, and hurting your knee, causing an ACL tear, or causing a knee sprain or, or some type of other injuries to the knee. These are a couple of injuries that I'm sure some of you are familiar with, some of the most popular ones uh, around, the, uh, around the world. I figured uh, you guys would see some of the things that we have to deal with over the years. And uh, the knee seems to be one of the areas uh, of most concern. And we, we say we may need you on the field today. Most commonly, the major type of injury in soccer are knee injuries. Most often injured is the ACL, the MCL, and the, and the meniscus. We look here for some of the common injuries, and we want to go over now how these injuries occur with the ankle. Um, you can see a, a nice uh, picture of the ankle injury there to the right. Um, most commonly, it's an inward movement of the foot, whether it's contact or non-contact. In this case, it's contact. You see contact, slide tackle, two players trying to kick the ball at the same time. Your non-contact injuries will be cutting, landing from a jump. Now looking at the knee, many knee injuries, such as like ACL ruptures, will occur away from contact. And that, that occurs from too much loading on the knee uh, during sudden stops and starts. Our pivoting or lateral movements can also contribute to some of the injuries. 
with the hamstring and groins, usually it's pulling on a muscle too far in a direction it doesn't want to go, or you're trying to contract the muscle really hard against resistance, or if you're trying to fire a muscle and it's not ready to fire, and also overuse. A lot of times, you'll see in the chart here coming up, a lot of times most injuries will occur towards the end of, end of games, and sometimes people think they pull a groin or a muscle because it's not stretched enough, and the, and the trainers or the coaches tell them you need to stretch more, your hamstrings are tight. If you look here on the chart, number of injuries during the course of the match, most of your injuries are occurring during the end of the game, towards the end of the game, the last 15 or 30 minutes of the game. And that's usually when most fatigue sets in. So again, if you're playing in leagues where you have the luxury of being able to rest your players or sub your players um, towards the end of the game, if you see the performance, sometimes we want to let that star player play a little bit longer because we know he's the best one on the field, but sometimes we're causing breakdown and possibly a future or, or season-ending injury. So some things we want to look at here are some good and bad training techniques. Some things that we've looked at with coaches and, and myself, obviously, being a coach for, for many years and, and working with a lot of athletes that have come to me that have been injured or, or coaches, is maintain balance with your training session. You know, don't always do the same thing, like always running sprints or always running four laps before practice. So there's your speed versus endurance. You want to mix it up where you're working on speed versus endurance. When you work on speed, you work on what's called fast twitch muscle fibers, which is that you have two types of muscle fibers, fast twitch and slow twitch. So you want to build up your fast twitch by doing speed work or by doing heavy weight lifting versus endurance, which would be jogging versus um, light weight lifting. Okay? And then running forward versus running backward. We always run forward. Not enough emphasis put on running backward, which is a great exercise for helping develop the, the gluteus maximus, your butt muscles, and also your hamstring muscles. Same thing with striking a ball. We want to work on different types, soft versus hard, making sure we're building up to uh, passing and knocking the ball before we go into hard shooting because that can cause the muscles to, as I stated before, try to fire at a, a, at a point to where it's not ready to fire. And then trunk rotation, right foot kick versus the left foot kick. If you have a, a right winger or you have a halfback or midfielder that's crossing the ball always with the right foot, you're getting a lot of rotation over his left leg. And you're also getting a lot of crossing over the body with the right leg. Switch it up and get an equal balance, even though he might not be left-footed. Have him do some crosses with his left foot to try to equate the balance because you start to get some differences in muscle pull that could cause injury. Some other good techniques, balancing on the right leg versus the left leg. If we're a right footer and we're taking shots with the right foot all the time, usually our left foot is good with balance. So if we're, if we're usually striking the ball with our right foot, left foot's good with balance. We want to try to change that up some. Work on the striking leg balance. Try to get some balance on the striking foot side. The other thing you want to work on is interval training. Jogging, sprinting, jumping, cutting, kicking. Don't always keep your, your training the same. Don't always work on just jogging. And then you want to look at some FIFA sanctioned tests, some tests that are, are good and used with referees, with, with professional teams, with international teams. FIFA beep test or the FIFA yo-yo test. You can look that up on the FIFA website. It'll explain it to you instead of going into detail about it now. And then you also have to, when you're training athletes, you want to kind of determine their target heart rate to know how much time uh, you want them running to see what their heart rate is at, and then also trying to get their VO2 max. That's something I would recommend you speaking to a medical professional on how to work that. And a lot of times you can get uh, some target heart rates read by getting a heart monitor and a watch. Some of the athletes might have uh, that available to them. That's a good way to know if they're training too hard or if they're staying within their target heart rate zone. Some other, um, some bad techniques is, you know, the same technique, not having enough information about your players or about your sports or about your team or about who they're playing and what their weaknesses are, and you keep doing the same thing and you're not working on what needs to be improved. Always running sprints after practice. This is something that could cause injury to, to the muscles when the muscles are tired or fatigued and, and you're continuing to run sprints. Maybe mix the sprints up in the middle before the muscles are fatigued. Um, shooting at the end of practice, again, firing a muscle chair, expecting it to pull more than it's needed to or wanting to after it's trained the entire night, running up or down hills, and then also performing tests that are not soccer specific. <clears throat> Some other continuing bad techniques for cardiovascular endurance, telling an athlete to stop running or telling them to keep running. How do we know that if we don't have a good baseline, if we don't know what their target heart rate is or their VO2 max? And this, you don't have to be a genius to get. You can have the advice or 
recommendations from a medical, from an athletic trainer, a physical therapist, they can help perform those tests, or even in some of the hospitals to help you understand so you know what the target heart rate is for the athlete or VO2 max. Target heart rate is determined by taking 220 minus your age. So if you're 20 years old and you take 220 minus your age and you get 200 and you want to exercise at 50% of your target heart rate, you need 100 beats per minute. If you want to exercise, usually you should be exercising between 60 to 80 and on the high side, 90% of your target heart rate. Okay? And then playing two or three full games in a week plus hard practice. Um, the other thing was going back was injured or not injured, telling an athlete to play or not play. That's something that you might need a doctor to assist you with or an athletic trainer. So again, you've got to be careful with when you have a player injured and tell them to keep playing. And same thing with games. You might have some of you guys play two games in a week or three games in a week, and then you have a couple practices really hard. Not allowing the body to regenerate is what's going to happen when you have those two or three games in a week. You need about 24 to 48 hours minimum for the body to regenerate. And so I'm going to talk about what we should do for regeneration and allowing the body some time. So here's Here's what can happen if you don't allow time. The body's unable to recover. You can cause, obviously, you'll, you'll be set with muscle fatigue, and then muscle injury can occur. When you have muscle injury occurring or muscle weakness or muscle fatigue, you're going to start to put a lot of stress on your ligaments. And in return, you're gonna, it's going to result in high rate of injury with muscle, when your muscles cannot recover. So here are some exercise tips. Cool down, replace fluids, eat properly, stretch, and rest. Some other tips would be Perform active recovery if you have the availability of a massage therapist. Take ice baths, get high quality sleep, and avoid overtraining. So some of the other things that we do for exercises used to reduce lower extremity injuries that we've looked at is getting balance. You know, we take a lot of, we, we focus a lot on quadriceps, and we do a lot when we're passing with the groin. We don't work a lot with the gluteus muscles, we don't ever do a lot of back passes and a lot of side passes with the outside of the foot. So you tend to focus on you training the groin a lot. So when you're offset that, you want to strengthen the glute muscles and that's some basic sideline uh, leg raises or lying on your stomach and doing some leg raises so you can focus on strengthening the glute muscles. Also looking at hamstring to quadricep. The quadricep to hamstring ratio should be a three to two ratio. So if you're, if you're in a gym and you're, you're using 100 pounds to say, and you want it to be a three to two ratio, quadriceps are always stronger than your hamstring. So if you're going to do 60 pounds of leg extension, you should be doing 40 pounds of leg curls. Okay, it should be a three to two ratio. And both of those machines need to be against gravity. So it's a seated leg extension. It cannot be a seated leg curl machine. It has to be the one you lie down on your stomach and curl up. So if it's a three to two ratio, 60 pounds quadriceps, 40 pounds hamstring. Same thing with calf muscles versus your shin muscles. We all do heel raises. We need to also focus on the opposite, toe raises, to build up the front side of the shin. Sometimes that's why we develop shin splints. We don't develop enough strength of the shin muscles. Core muscles versus back muscles, making sure uh, as we're working both sides, not just the abdominal area, or same thing, just not just the back area. Pay attention to detail with your athletes. I'm going <clears> to <throat> go over some exercises afterwards that we're going to look at. And remember to ask questions. If you, if you have any questions, just to, to write them down. We're going to be going over questions afterwards. If you have any, to, to just write them down, and, and Dave will go ahead and present them to me. Um, some of the things I want you to look at when you're, when you're training your athletes is when your athletes are running, you'll see a lot of times some of the ones that are underdeveloped in their gluteus muscles with their gluteus maximus or their abductors, you'll see their knees will start to go in. When their knees start to go in, they put a lot of strain on their groin muscles. They're constantly firing their groin muscles as you run and your knees go in. You also see some athletes complaining of IT band tightness, the, the band that goes down the outside of your leg. That's occurring because your knees are driving in and putting more tension on your IT band. A lot of times that could be corrected just by correcting the alignment of the knee when your athlete is running. Stand in front of him and watch him run at you and watch how their knees go. Most commonly, the biggest error is the knees will drop in. So you'll see the knees angling in, you'll see the groin firing for the knees to come in, and you'll see the gluteus maximus muscles aren't strong enough to keep the knee out. And then again, you'll start to see pulling on the IT band. Same thing with squatting, same routine, single leg or double leg, leg. Don't let the knees go in or out, and the knees don't let them go too far forward. 
And then same thing with jumping and landing. When you watch somebody jump, don't let them push off and drive their knees in. And when they land, same thing. Don't let their knees go in or go too far over their toes. So one of the things I would recommend is FIFA 11 Plus program. If you go to the FIFA.com website, and then I, I linked it here, or actually I just cut and paste it here. What you need to do is cut and paste it. You can go to uh, the fmark.com 11 plus uh, home. You'll be able to get the program there. And this program is used to reduce injuries. It, we, there's been a lot of research done. Um, they've used it all over the world. Spain is using it. They now have some of the Asian teams using it, and they have a couple of the other uh, teams using it. Actually, Spain was the biggest one, and obviously being that they just won the World Cup, uh, being the, the best team on the field. They, uh, they heavily uh, recommend this program. So it's used to reduce injuries for male and female soccer players ages 14 and older. Teams that are performing this at least two times a week have decreased injuries by 30 to 50 percent. So I'm going to go over some of those exercises here, and you'll be able to see what we're looking at. And you look at the body position here on the girl on the left, and you see she's in perfect alignment. Her knee is in alignment with her hips and also with her toes and her sternum. You look over to the right, and you see how her knee angles in. That's what I'm talking about. We'll look at the next slide, and it'll be similar. And also, you see how her knee angles in, and you see how her knee also goes over her toes. Those are some things you want to be careful with. And we're going to transition now into running. You'll see here with running, running straight ahead. On the left, same technique, perfect technique. Knee is straight in alignment and not too far over the toes. You look to the right on the wrong one, and the knee's dropping in. That's what I mean watching your athletes when they run towards you. If you see their knee coming in like that, not only are they straining that ligament on the inside, so if you look right here, this ligament here can get strained, and on the outside, this meniscus here can get pinched. You also, when we tear our ACL, it's an inward motion of our knee, so the knee comes in here. That inward motion puts most of the stress on the ACL. You also are getting an internal rotation of your hip. That motion is occurring here at the hip. So the IT band that goes from here down to the knee is now being stretched. So a lot of times you see people get an IT band tightness here on the side, and you start to tell them, well, you need to stretch it, you need to roll on it and get a foam roller. Those are all fine and great, but if you don't correct this technique where she's dropping her knee in, you're going to continue to have those issues. And see, if you stand up and you pull your leg in like this, you're going to feel this muscle right here on the inside start to strain or pull and feel tight. What do you ever hear of a butt muscle tear? Never. These butt muscles aren't firing in this technique here. You're firing your groin muscles. The majority of us tear our groin muscles, or pull our groin muscles, or pull on our hamstring muscles. So this is key. You're going to see some redundancies here as I move along with some of the techniques. So planting and cutting, look at the left there, great technique. At the right, her body control isn't as good, and you see her knee dropping in. Or you see her straight up and down, and then you get hyperextension of the knee. Then moving forward, jumping with shoulder contact on the left, good form. See how they have the knees in alignment? And, and right there, the knees aren't coming over the toes on the left side. And then you look to the right, knee drops in, or the legs are straight up and down. Lateral jumps, single leg lateral jump, jump into the left, jump into the right. Good alignment on the left, look to the right, see how the knee drops in. Okay. Continuing forward with squats, with toe raises, same thing. Look at the wrong side on the right there. Very evident she's dropping her knees in, or she's bending forward, or she's dropping straight down and putting her knees over her toes. This is some activities that you can do with your teammates, with your players. Single leg squat, you can hold on to each other and have them drop down and do a squat. Make sure they stay in alignment like they are on the left. Obviously, to the right, you don't want them to do. Okay. If you have any questions with these, make sure you write them down. And again, you can address them when we're done this conversation. We're almost done. I have a few more exercises to show you. Here's a single leg stance while holding the ball. You can rotate the ball to the left or the right, up over your head. And again, Watch how they pivot over their legs. See how they pivot on the left versus on the right. Wrong, the correct technique versus the wrong technique. And then throwing the ball. So now you're making it a little bit more dynamic hand-eye coordination while they're trying to balance on one leg. And remember, they're going to be able to balance on their non-shooting foot a lot better than their shooting foot. So make sure you incorporate this with both legs. Here's another test where you test your partner, single, single leg stance. A little bit of perturbation, pushing on your partner, see how they can resist, see how they can maintain their balance, make sure they keep a good alignment, left versus the right, right side being wrong. Now we're moving on to some exercises to help uh, work on the core area, and we'll have a progression here. This is just a static bench where you, it's called a plank exercise where you've got good alignment, see how she's perfectly aligned on the left. You look to the right, she starts to sway her back or raise her back up. 
that's showing uh, a weakness in the core area. Now we've got a progression from this one to where she just holds it. The next one, she would just now raise one leg up and hold. And see how she drops down on the right and correct technique. And a progression from this one would be alternating legs. So you alternate, lift the right leg up, put it down. Alternate, lift the left leg up, put it down. These are very good exercises, not only for the core, but you're also strengthening the glute muscle. This muscle right here that I was telling you about, strengthening the glutes, very good for that. Also strengthens the hamstring. If you keep the leg straight on this activity, it strengthens the hamstring. If you take this foot and you bend it, and now you have a 90 degree position of her knee, now you're working on this glute area here. Okay? And this is the last exercise. This helps strengthen the hamstrings. You have a partner here, hold the legs, and you have this, your, your athlete, make sure that they stay in perfect alignment, straight alignment as they're moving all the way down. You don't want them to do this technique where they start to bend at the hips. That's because they cannot stabilize with their core or their hamstrings. And when they're coming back up or they're going down, their hamstrings aren't able to stabilize or strength to hold the position. So they'll start to bend forward at the, at the hips area. So these are, are most of the techniques that you can use. Uh, these will help strengthen the hamstrings. Hamstrings seem to be one of the weaker muscles, which is one of the reasons why our ACLs are torn and also with that inward motion of the knee. Most commonly, the quads are strengthened through a lot of our techniques, kicking, jumping, shooting. The hamstrings usually are the weakest, so you want to focus on some hamstring strengthening. And